Okay, so what happens when we are learning a new skill? Um, we're picking up piano, we're thinking of getting good at tennis, we're you know, starting Watts Atelier and we're going to try to get good at painting and drawing because we always wanted to and we left it behind to do a, a job as a lawyer and now we're retired and kids are growing up and we want to get more serious. Well, what happens with the brain, it doesn't matter if you're 13, 14, 22, 82. I just talked to a student that called about classes. She was in her 60s and she was saying, well, you know, I really want to get good at art and I want to make a living at it and I'm pretty good at drawing, but I really think I need to work on my painting. And right there, already I kind of started seeing a little bit of holes in her thinking and maybe the way she was coming about um, thinking about mastery, thinking about drawing, thinking about painting. Maybe no, no one's ever explained to her these concepts. So immediately, and I told her, I said, well, I'm about to do actually a podcast on exactly what I'm going to talk to you about. So I talked to her about that. But when you learn a new process, what happens is the way it works, and I'm going to read this a little bit more because it's not, you know, it's, it's a little, it's not difficult to comprehend, but when you make an effort to replace old patterns of sensing, movement, and cognition, this brings into use your cognitive system, which is associated with the habitual system and an effort system. So you have a habitual system, an effort system, and this, the cognitive system. Uh, what's going to happen, uh, the effort system is associated with a, a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is at the base of your, 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 your brain. And what will happen is the cognitive, cognitive and effort systems will become subsets of the habitual system. So they'll kind of come together when you're learning a new skill and they'll become part of the habitual system just long enough to modify it and create a new behavior. Now once you've done this through, usually practice, like say you're trying to practice a head from three quarters from Andrew Loomis or something, which is uses a hypothetical situation. Well, you might have to draw that, that angle 10 times, 15 times, conscientiously, each one taking 15, 20, 30 minutes. And then you may have to test yourself by putting it away and seeing if you can now redraw that without looking at the information and see if it's actually been retained. Well, this process, what's happening in short is the cognitive and effort systems click into that habitual system and then reprogram it. And once they've reprogrammed it, they then recede back into the distance and that new habit has taken place. Now, once you have that new habit in place, it doesn't mean you're scot-free and that you don't have to do anything else with it. And that's something that George doesn't talk about in his book that I wanted to add was simply once you've got it up, keep it up because it's easier to maintain skills than it is to get them back. Now, if you've ever been in shape, you work really hard for two, three months, you eat really good, you get up, you get on a running program, a weightlifting program, and you do it religiously for three months. And you start seeing good, you get in shape, you start seeing your body get toned, you start losing the excess fat, you start feeling better, more energy level. That doesn't mean you're going to stay in that state forever, right? So... Once you've got it up like that, you might be, maybe you have a, again, a difficult thing happens in your life and now you have to cut your workouts back to two days a week or three days a week when you were doing five days a week. Well, you're not gonna see the results, but you're gonna maintain all that hard work that you did and it's gonna take a little bit of effort to do that. Now, if you were to say derail, like I talked about earlier, and just quit working out altogether for a month, you've got a good month or two to get back to where you're even close to where you were when you took that month off. And it's just common sense, but at the same time, it's so demoralizing. Whereas if you had just taken uh, the initiative to maybe do a little bit of maintenance in, while you were going through that difficult period, you would have preserved a great deal of those uh, results without having to go through that pain and anguish of a month of hard work just to get back to where you were, or two months or something. So the old saying is, once you got it up, keep it up. Um, and the skill has become intuitive, it still requires practice to maintain. That was what I put in there. I mean, you just have to continue to practice these skills as you put them in place. That's where it gets progressively more difficult in the process of learning art, for example, because you're gonna be learning lots of different languages, visual languages, charcoal, pen and ink, graphite, watercolor, gouache, oil, digital. And each one is gonna take some time to get good at. There's a lot of common denominators amongst them, which is great. And a lot of them are going to help other ones as you're training with them. But you have to learn to try to always slip in a little bit of the ones you've already gotten good at to maintain them. And then be okay with the fact that they're not going to be jetting forward. They're just going to be in a maintenance uh, holding pattern until you can then focus a little bit more on them. And, and in that manner, what we want to do in art or in anything, I think, is bring up everything consistently together. And not have it be, okay, I'm just going to hyper obsess about figure at the detriment of landscape, still life, portrait, everything else. 
now I'm going to go over and I'm going to only study portrait and forget about landscape that I was just on for two months. I, you know, you're going to do, you have to do some kind of prioritizing like that, but you should maintain a little bit of landscape when you phase it out to make sure that you're maintaining what you learned during that upward push until you can get back to it to push it even further. And that way, all of your skill sets are staying at higher levels and holding patterns while other ones jump forward, while other ones are being maintained. That can get very challenging. If you're not good at multitasking and you're not used to that kind of um, uh, brain working on so many different levels and layers, and still, that's not even talking about having your personal relationships, your husband and wife, your boyfriend, girlfriend, um, whatever that you have to maintain and other things, you know, or a personal career while you're trying to do this. So you can see where the challenge for this mastery is, is, is oftentimes not taken up by many people because it's just too hard. We call it fighting the good fight, or at least that's what I call it. It's the hero's journey, if you think of Joseph Campbell. It's, it's this idea of, of going on this, this journey to mastery that encompasses all areas of your life and really is the true um, calling of all humans. All people have their, their calling. And you have, number one, you have to find it, and then you have to cultivate it, you have to develop it, you have to master it. And, and during that, you have to uh, have some panache and some elegance as you go through your life, right? So the key is how do you move forward in mastery? You practice primarily for the sake of practice, and that is not in vogue these days. So you practice simply to practice, because you love to practice. Rather than being frustrated on the plateau, you learn to appreciate and enjoy it as much as the upward surges. Okay, so that is something that, um, you know, again, it's not, and, and, and this is where Pressfield will talk about the war on mastery. So society's war against mastery is what he calls it. And today's immediate gratification climate of thought leads people to the promise that they can learn a new skill or lose weight without patient long-term effort and promise of great riches without the production of value in return. So people are expecting, it's like Fight Club, you know, we're sold this incredible bill of goods that we're supposed to be these supermodels that drive expensive cars and live in beautiful houses and we don't really have to do anything. It's just given to us. Um, we're, we're owed it. It's, 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 a, it's a generation of, of um, entitlement, right? So we need to, and that, that is completely flies in the face of mastery. It has no place in the journey on mastery, right? So um, it is a recipe for disaster, as he says it. So the rhythm of this pattern is one of epiphany following another, one fantasy crowded out by the next, climax is piled upon climax, there's no plateau. There's no plateau in this way of thinking. It's just moving from party to party, to good thing, to good thing, to happy, to happy, to fun, to fun, without ever having to make the sacrifices and the hard work that requires to actually become proficient at something very tangible and difficult. So. Consumerism has achieved an unprecedented dominance over our value system. One must fight the good fight to overcome this. And many naysayers and skeptics uh, will be there And uh, when you start to train in this manner. That could be your parents. That could be your siblings. That could be your best friends. Oh, you're doing art? What? You're taking the same class? Didn't you just take head drawing last term? You're taking it again? That sounds like a scam. The guy's just ripping you off. Da -da 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 -da. I, I mean, you can just hear the negativity and the naysaying because people don't understand anymore this idea that mastery requires repetition. It's not about being brilliant. The more intelligent you are, the more difficult it is to master things because you're lazy usually and you try to look for ways around things because you're too smart. So you're always thinking, oh, well, I can figure out a way around this. I don't have to do the hard work. They have to do the hard work because they're stupid. I'm smart, so I shouldn't have to do the hard work. I can cheat on my test or I can do this or I can just study and cram and then forget it all. Why does it matter anyway? I knew so many people like that in school and they didn't really go on to great things. They cultivated a sense of, of kind of complacency, apathy, and quick fixes, and cheating, and changing, and altering in order to not have to follow the true path of mastery. So um, this is called, you know, so one must fight that, you know, you're going to, okay, so the funny thing is, is you almost have to adopt a contrarian attitude, and that attitude means that you have to do the opposite of what everyone else is doing nowadays. So if I see everyone going in that direction, I'm going to go in that direction, because I'm not, I don't want to follow the herd. And the herd right now, again, is being rushed along by this immediate gratification society that we've built where, of consumerism where everybody just wants a quick fix. I'm not saying everybody because if you're watching this video, um, it, it will probably either you know, spark a very 
sincere interest in it or it won't it'll fall on deaf ears oh this guy's full of it he's just on a soapbox talking about whatever as he always does and and i'm not going to listen to him and and that's okay that's totally cool um so what i'm looking for are those people out there that are ready to commit to a life of mastery um if they're coming into my program that's what i'm expecting from them that's what i'm living that's what i'm doing i'm not saying i've obtained it but i'm well on my way to it and i understand the pitfalls i understand the bruises the the pain the anguish, the frustration, the perseverance, the patience, everything that I'm talking about, I have lived through for the last 25 years with thousands of students, but also in my own trajectory of my own personal advancement in the, in the road of mastery. So not am I, am I shepherding all these other people on the road to mastery, but I have to do it myself at the same time, which is fighting, the, is walking the walk, so to speak, or, or talking the talk. I'm, I'm actually in there with you doing exactly what I'm telling you to do, and I'm still doing it. So I'm not doing it to make you impress you, but to impress upon you the importance of these concepts. Like if I look back, I, I posted a while back on Facebook, you know, a stack of my drawings that I had to go through that were my best drawings. And it was about five feet tall. That's thousands and thousands of hours of effort put into just that part of my drawing training. And that's, and I, and I will do more and more of that for here on out. But and it's not to deter you or to, to make you frustrated, but it just is what it is. And not everybody is going to be taking the master's journey. And that's what we're going to talk about in a minute. But what we do need to do is we need to love the plateau. And that's what I'm going to talk about next is loving the plateau. So we just talked about society's fight against mastery and how it's not conducive to be on a trajectory of mastery these days. No one wants to spend a lifetime becoming a great stonemason or a great marble worker like they did back in Michelangelo's time. But what a travesty. When you find someone now that can actually do marble work, you have to pay a fortune because nobody can do it. So we're quickly becoming a society where if you can find someone that's willing to take the time to become very skilled at anything masterfully, then they're worth a lot of money. You have to pay them a lot. And so this is something that you can be very excited about. If you're willing to take this journey, you're going to separate yourself from a good half to three quarters of society that just is too lazy to even go on it. And they're just going to go through the paces and they're going to be going through life and they're not going to be making waves and they're not going to be changing anything and they're probably not going to be maybe contributing on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an incredibly great level uh, of changing the world in a better way, hopefully. But th not everybody is called to do that. Some people, there's, there's different layers. And so it's not wrong if you're not on that. But the people I'm talking to right now are the people that I want to get to that, that are going to be taking this journey. Um, so... If, okay, so it says if our life is a good one, a life of mastery, then most of it will be spent on the plateau. Where in our upbringing, where in our upbringing, schooling, career, are we explicitly taught to value and enjoy and even to love the plateau? That long stretch of diligent effort with no seeming progress. Okay, so that's, we're, we're not taught that in school anymore. We're not taught to think like mastery. We're taught to quickly learn things and then take a test on it and get an A or B or C and then move to the next thing. And most of what we learn in the first thing quickly doesn't get applied to any, any part of our life that we can see any value to necessarily. Sometimes it does. But and it just gets shot right out the other side or it gets, it gets jettisoned because it's not of, of essential importance. So as we take the master's path and we learn to love it, practicing, we should get more energy and more excitement because we're picking what we want to study now. We're not having to do this with English and math and science areas that maybe we don't have aptitudes in or we don't have any interest in. And I think, um, in my opinion, it would be nice if we could specialize earlier or find the aptitudes that students have. Yes, make them well-rounded to some degree, but not to drill them with math up to the upper echelon levels of calculus and pre-cal and trigonometry when you're not even, when you're going to be a painter, you know, or you're going to be uh, me you know, mechanic, or you're going to be doing something else. Um, maybe all you need is long division or something. So, I mean, it would be nice if you could pick a trajectory. And I think, you know, someday maybe this will be the case because the, you know, the trajectory that we're in right now, the educational system really hasn't changed. And it's, it's kind of archaic. I mean, it hasn't changed with the development of all technology and all the things that we have now. So hopefully we'll see a change in that way. But so I was lucky enough to have had an incredibly difficult childhood, which I say in a funny way, because um, I was fraught with learning deficiencies when I was a young kid. And I know I've mentioned this probably before, but I was held back in first grade. I, they thought I, was, I had dyslexia, a form of dyslexia. I had a speech impediment. I had difficult times learning, uh, difficult time learning certain things. 
and, I, and, it, and it was mostly I just didn't have an interest. You know, I was, I was wired visually and I wanted to draw. And so math didn't interest me, English didn't interest me. At that time I was doing what, what all kids want to do, which is what they were naturally wired to, but they try to beat that out of you. Um, because they don't, you know, you need to go do your math, you need to go to your English, this drawing thing is for kids, you know, it's not, not something you're going to be, you know, cultivating. So they just kind of poo-poo it and put it aside. So I know a lot of you probably had similar experiences with that. But um, this really ignited a great yearning uh, for learning and exploration and self-education for me. And, and I remember my first uh, sports, then school, then art, I was constantly, there was a period where a tipping point hit where I was so embarrassed to be the oldest kid in class and kind of the dumb kid or whatever you want to call it, but um, I just felt that way. And then I got my competitive spirit up and I learned that through hard work and through patient practice, and I actually put myself on the master's journey on accident um, out of fear and embarrassment at a young age, but something clicked and that was around fifth grade, maybe sixth grade. And from that point on, I mean, it was off to the races for me. I mean, I started excelling in athletics. I started excelling in, in academia. Um, and then I, uh, my art became kind of secondary to that because I was so excited about these other areas. I was, I was learning to love learning. And I had some good teachers at the time that really were inspirational uh, in that process. Uh, people like George Leonard that really understood the concept of, of leveraging a, a child in a, in a caring manner and not just beating you into the tarmac or beating um, your love of life out of you or your interest for art or creativity. So I was very lucky and my dad was one of those great teachers for me as well. And some of you may not have had that experience. Try not to hold resentment and grievances towards it. See if you can be compassionate self-forgiveness, get rid of that and start moving forward on the path to mastery without the baggage of these naysayers and these people that held you down or told you you were never going to be a good artist in fifth grade and that just said oh, it's a waste of your time and you suck and you're terrible. Uh, you might have had a bad teacher that did that and you're still carrying that. I still see students in my school that are still traumatized by what their fifth grade teacher told them about art. You know, So again, we need to learn to not carry that with us and let it go. And we're going to talk about surrender when we get into one of the keys that he talks about. That's one of them is surrender. So it ignited a great learning in me, a great interest in learning. And I think in order to instill this in oneself, one must get lucky enough to stumble across something that piques their interest enough to make it part, uh, past the first plateau and see the legitimate spurt in forward and skill. So what you need to do is find that thing. And it may be art, it may be drawing, it may be jewelry, it may be fashion design, it may be um, making movies, it might be helping make movies by doing storyboarding or concepting, it could be any of these things. Uh, but find something that really grabs you. And then this could be almost anything. Um, and uh, it could be academia, it could be sports, like I say in here. And this is where a great teacher, an inspired teacher, can make all the difference, okay, in the master's personality. I said, I would inevitably find myself thinking, oh boy, another plateau, good. I can just stay on it and keep practicing. Sooner or later, there will be another spurt. It was one of the warmest moments on my journey. And that was something that uh, was from George Leonard's book, a quote from there. Um, so the endless succession of classes was rewarding precisely because it was, in the Zen sense, nothing special. It was just going through the process. So I liken this to when I first went to school and how I felt when I arrived at this little tiny hole in the wall school in the San Fernando Valley run by Fred Fixler, who was a Frank Riley student, direct from that lineage. And he had started a small school. And when I arrived at that school, it literally was like coming home. It was like walking into an ashram or a, a church for me. And it was this little hole in the wall. And it took a really certain kind of eye to just appreciate what was in those little, that little humble abode, that little humble, humble place that was created. And, and so I put in here, um, I liken this to just going to the small quaint school, getting first there first early in the morning like I always did. The dew was still on the plants, the air was cold enough to see your breath. I would be waiting outside the door, I'd be kind of walking around so excited to get in and start the day of drawing and waiting to go into that institution with the past efforts on the wall inspiring me to follow in their steps, there was a humbleness about the place, an almost religious feeling, as if entering a church or an ashram. I had found my purpose, my calling, it was like coming home. Um, I loved sharpening the pencils to a long taper, turning the newsprint with care, the monotonous Mozart playing over and over. We only had one CD that, or tape that played incessantly. The smell of the solvents and the oil paints, the sound of learning, of striving, of working toward mastery. Mastery of the pencil sharpening, mastery of edges, mastery of values, of design, calligraphy, memorization. I loved it all. So when I was in there, 
it's what helped me, I think, to create the, the later create the atelier. My favorite time was going in and simply training, training in that environment, the smells, the sounds, the feeling, the feeling of camaraderie, the feeling of energy. Um, just being in a place where people were trying to get good at something and it was so honest. It was just, let's get a drawing on the wall. Let me do a nice figure drawing that's nice enough to be put on the wall as an example for other students to show them what can be obtained, what should be obtained in the level that we're aspiring to. That was all it was about. It wasn't about making a bunch of money. It wasn't about out going and conquering an industry. It was simply about the love of the craft. And that is what I fell in love with. And that's what a good teacher will do for you, is it'll get you to fall in love with the craft. At that point, you're golden. It's just a matter of time before you get good enough to do something monetary with it. But maybe you don't want to. Maybe you just decide that you want to keep it a very purist um, activity for yourself because you've already spent a lot of time making money at something else. And why do you want to jump right back from the frying pan into the fire? You know, why do you want to get back into another career that now is your passion and try to make it into a money-making venture, which is going to make it uh, uh, kind of have to be kind of compromised a little bit, I would imagine, and, or at least I've had to. So, um, so it, George goes in, in to put it, um, you know, I loved everything about it, the ritual. This is what he talks about, his dojo, his school that he went to. I loved everything about it, the ritual that was always the same yet always new, bowing upon entering, pulling my membership card from the rack at the front desk, changing to my gi in the dressing room. I loved the comforting smell of sweat, the subdued talk. I loved coming out of the dressing room and checking to see which other students were already warming up. I loved bowing again as I stepped on the mat, feeling the cool, firm surface on the soles of my feet. I loved taking my place in the long row of Aikidoists, all sitting in uh, Siza, the Japanese meditation position, position. I loved the entry of the, our teacher, the ritual bows, the warm-up techniques, and then my heart pounding, my breath rushing as the training increased in speed and power. What a great description of his love of just going into this environment that he was so familiar with, but yet was always new. New challenges, new things happening. That's what a good environment is. That's the environment you need to find for yourself. If you can't find it, maybe you go online. Maybe you do our, try our online program. It has a lot of that same um, love and care and interest put into it because that's what my goal was with it. That was my in intention, my motivation behind creating it in the first place. Um, but if not, you know, get a group of uh, students and find a place where you can create your own environment. Go to a community college and get into classes and just use the model time. Um, so another thing, so as we go through this, we've got a couple other few things to talk about with this uh, loving the plateau. Um, watchfulness. Sometimes the seed of ambition will creep in and cause you to start sh cutting short corners and looking for shortcuts. That ambition, oh, I want to get there. I want to get there now. I want to be working at Pixar. I wanted to work there uh, when I came in a year in, and now it's already a year, and I'm not even close. And so you're starting to look for ways to try to get there faster and not stay on the legitimate course of the mastery course, right? We're staying on that consistent training, diligent, relaxed, don't fight against what is, right? So this can lead to the perils of getting ahead of oneself. It is okay for ambition to be there, but one must be willing to stay on the plateau for as long as is necessary. With the online training, this can be a very real issue um, as you are left to navigate the program with yourself as the monitor of whether you are cutting corners or methodically following the courses as they were designed. I designed that in a very specific trajectory, a very specific manner. It doesn't mean you can't jump forward every time, once in a while and kind of see where you're going to inspire yourself, but then you should then fall back and continue to work your way up to that level. Because to jump past things, you're just going to be hurting yourself. Now again, it always sounds like a sales pitch. Oh, you guys just tell me this so that I'll stay in the program longer. It is what it is. I mean, again, if you have the mentality where you think that way, you're already shortcutting yourself by thinking that everyone's out to get you, that everyone's out to take advantage of you, and that every system is really built that way. And if you really believe that, then you're in deep trouble already, right? Um, and it's going to lead to shortcuts. It's going to lead to looking for the quick fix. To me, it just sounds a little bit more like, oh, I don't believe that that's the way it has to be. That's way too much work. I can find a smarter, better way to do it and faster. And that's, that's where you're, you know, you're going to kind of shoot yourself in the foot maybe. So be careful with that, that kind of thinking. So I talk a little bit about like going to the studio to work is one of my most moments of truest happiness. It is the time when all the other crap goes away. I start to get cues of pleasure, my books on the shelves, the particular odor of the paints, the painting on the easel, the room. These cues begin to tie into what I've painted and what I am going to paint that day. 
Another really well put quote from that book is this one. When it is good, I feel this is the essential me. It is the routine itself that feeds me. If I didn't do it, I'd be betraying the essential me. That really sums up the respect and reverence this person has for the craft of their training. They come in and present to themselves through this process their essential self. And by cheating that essential, you're only cheating that essential self by, by um, you know, shortcutting stuff and, and doing these things incorrectly. But so you really want to just fall in love with that process. So that was falling in love, being on the plateau, loving the plateau, that endless sequ sequence of training that we must accept what is and not fight it because it doesn't change. It's never changed. It never will change. Mastery will stay consistent. It's almost like a truth. So we need to bend for it. We don't expect it to bend for us. So the next thing we'll talk about is just some, uh, yeah, some, some, we'll go into the, the, the different types of people, the characteristics, the types, and you may very well find yourself in, in one of these, and I'm sure you will. The key here is going to be honesty. Be honest with yourself because you've got to sometimes face the fact that you're a dabbler, you know, and you've always been a dabbler. And that's why you're where you're at in your life, maybe. You know, you say, well, God, I don't, don't have the job I want. I don't have the life that I always wanted for myself. I don't have all the things that I always wanted. Well, those take sacrifices, consistency, and the master's journey is what gives you the skills in order to be able to parlay them into a legitimate career that you could make the kind of money to deserve the kind of things that you want for yourself. But you've got to earn those. They're not going to be handed on a silver platter. So what we're going to talk about next are the personality types and just be honest with yourself and it doesn't mean you can't change them through meditation and work and practice and training. And many of us uh, are hybrids of these um, archetypes. So don't feel like, oh, I'm a dabbler. You may be a dabbler in one area and a master in another. And that's very common. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment, is the different uh, personality types and which ones are conducive to mastery and which ones are not.